Hello, everyone. My name is Yuasa Manami from the British Council. Thank you for joining us today. Today, in celebrating the world premiere of the opera, A Dream of Armageddon, I am happy to invite the conductor, named Mr. Hazushi Ono, the composer, Mr. Dai Fujikura, and the writer, Mr. Harry Haras, for this live talk event. We hope so. The three of them are going to be joining from different locations. So this is going to be shown live, streamed live on YouTube. So the three of them, before inviting the three guests, we'd like to have the director of British Council for Japan, Matthew Knowles, for an opening remark. Matthew? Hey everyone, it's lovely to be joining you for this special event. It promises to be a very thought-provoking discussion. And of course, it's the celebration of a special new production. The online event is part of a festival called Culture Connectus, run by the British Council in partnership with the British Embassy. I was reading again A Dream of Armageddon on Culture Day this week, and it's a haunting read. Um, it's a read that has real resonance with the global pandemic that we have all endured this year. The theme of loss, the loss of a dream, the loss of a loved one, the sense of an enduring nightmare. This year, the world has passed into a place that none of us were expecting. And for many, it's been a place of fear and sadness. I think of all the times that we were unable to get out into the world and do the things which give purpose to our lives. In the digital space, though, the lockdowns and the travel restrictions have forced us to be more innovative. And they've, they've forced us particularly to be innovative in the ways that we connect. I also feel that online communities have been for many a real source of strength and solace. And certainly we've come to a new appreciation of the natural world, but also of the world of culture. More recently in Japan, it has been wonderful to get back into our cultural venues. I think we've all um, remembered so vividly the things that we were missing. And this production is so special because it has had to conquer um, the pandemic's obstacles. It's had to conquer the disruption. And I, and I think it's a very helpful reminder about how precious the international collaboration really is. On behalf of the British Council, let me say just a few thank yous first to Maestro Kazushi Ono, to Dai Fujikura and to Harry Ross, for agreeing to share their reflections tonight. I also want to thank New National Theatre Theater Tokyo uh, for this very poignant commission and to my own brilliant British Council team for um, masterminding the, the technology and arranging this at very short notice. My, my closing thought, um, it's, it's a moment in history when we are all living through the same story and the power of the arts is to confirm each one of us as members of a single community. And that is what the Culture Connects Us Online Festival is all about. So my warm greetings to all of you, and I very much hope you enjoy tonight's discussions. Thank you. Thank you for that. So without further ado, we'd like to invite the three guests so they are super busy as they are running up to the premiere. They're from uh, joining us from the location. So we have the conductor, Mr. Kazushi Ono, the composer, Mr. Dai Fujikura, who works in the UK mostly, and also the writer, the, Mr. Harry Ross, will be here for the talk session. So, so we're going to ask them about the journey that led up to this premiere, and also, given that we're in the time now, the meaning significance of having the international collaboration in this time and age. If you have a question, people who are seeing this live, we are accepting questions on Twitter. So hashtag culture connect us. And then if you can write the question, we'll be able to pick them up. So Ono-san, Fujikura-san, Harry-san, if you can take it away. So, I am I am the director at the NTT, Kazushi Ono. Thank you very much for taking this time to plan this event today. Thank you for the members of the British Council for giving us the opportunity to do this. So Mr. Fujikura's new opera, 
as the National Theatre of Tokyo. So this is something we started two years ago as a Japanese composer. It's a really a transfer to a Japanese composer. So we do this to, uh, once every two years. The first one was Roni Shimura's Shion no Monogatari, Shion story. And that story, at the time when that project started, I was actually contacting Mr. Dai Fujikura to take on board the second installment of this opera performance. And I spoke to him about it. And if you can think about what he can do for our production of the new National Theatre. So we started this conversation three or four years ago, actually. So this year, given that we are in the middle of a pandemic, we had a lot of obstacles. And surprisingly, as a coincidence, the NTT have two operas that are uh, uh, strongly uh, embedded in the British culture. The first one, it was just finished. The first one was the Britain the Midnight Summer's Dream was the first one. And, and we had the fairies. The charming fairies were the, it was a dream about the fairies. And then we have the, another dream, the second dream a dream of Armageddon. So we have these two dreams that we are showing through this installment. And the original work is by H.G. Wells. A dream of Armageddon is what is called the title. So we call it the final war of the world is what it says in the Japanese title. So H.G. Wells, why Mr. Fujikura chose this is something he will probably share with us later on. But H.G. Wells' writing is basically science fiction, and he is the, the master of science fiction. And it's the first story where you have alien appearing, a Martian appearing in the story, and you have this ultra space wars happening, for example, a chaos. So he would write stories of such. And then the final war of the world is what it is, this A Dream of Armageddon. So surprisingly, in that story, he wrote this in 1901. And in that story, there was a weapon of mass destruction was actually written there as a dream, as part of a dream. And also after that, in the first part of the 20th century, so the totalitarianism, the whole flow of the world war, follows. So he actually wrote this as part of a dream. Which, so Weapon of Mass Destruction was the first, it appeared first in the World War One. is how we humanity saw. But in 1901, having that Hichi Wells has written about this, this is an incredibly surprising prediction or the foresight that the author has. So he has the instinct. So it's by this author. So based on that story that he's written, Mr. Fujikura has created a new opera from this. And this is what we want to talk about through today's hour that we have. And within that, what I'd like to start off is, I'd like to first ask Ms. Fujikura-san, and then, when I spoke to him, what should we do? And he said, Fujikura-san, at the time, maybe just a few days after, he, he came back to me and said, I want to work with this work by H.G. Wells, A Dream of Armageddon. So he's the one who suggested that this is the um, the work that we were. So maybe we can ask Dai-san, Fujikura-san, what did you see in this work? What did you want to do this with this work? So even before that, actually, first of all, Ono-san, when he talk to me about what should we start to work on. So, and I still have his email, I remember it. So the topic, if you can be relevant for today's time, 
the modern times, we want a, a topic that's related to the modern time today, is what he said. But normally, if it's an opera, you talk about the Greek mythologies, and those are the common themes that you hear and see in opera. But he said, no, we, I want to focus on something that's now, something that people can empathize with now in today's world. And that's what he asked for. And with that in mind, I, I, I'm always reading lots of books and I'm always thinking of what kind of work I can use for my opera. And within that, I came across H.G. E. Wells. I've, I've always loved this author. So within that, I thought this short story, uh, Dream by Armageddon, when I read this, I don't know how to say, but it's an incredible work that I encountered because it's so incredible and create it directly into a stage. It's not simple like that. For me, in order to create an opera or create to a stage, it's a whole different stream of things. So if it's a play, if it's a movie, everyone's talking. But what we do is <coughs> we're making it into an opera, which means people are singing. So that means everything has to be expressed through music. So into this labyrinth, everyone needs to go into that labyrinth and experience it for themselves. So this should be the trigger of the inspiration for people. And I was looking for a work that had that kind of inspiration. And then Ono-san's request also Oh, rang true. And I think I'm the type of composer which Harry can talk a lot about. I'm not a composer who writes political themes, usually, themed music. But this original story was based on a dream, and it was written in 1901. However, it's still is very relevant in today's world, a world which has already experienced World War One and Two. So I thought that if I were able to make an opera out of this, I would be respecting the spirit of the story that H.G. Wells put in, and then and, uh, probably be able to adapt it into something that's very suitable for an opera. And that's why I said, Ono-san, what about this work? And um, Harry. Thank you. Um, how are you? I'm good, thank, thank you. Thank you for joining us today. And then um, I've heard that then, uh, you and Dai, um, uh, friend, and since long time, and then uh, collaborated already and, uh, with us, uh, several productions. And then uh, especially you were a singer, and that's, and, uh, that's the reason why, singer and uh, artist and then uh, um, uh, libertist. And, and then that's the reason why um, while um, Dyson um, uh, was composing, always you were, you were writing the text, and then in the same time you sang immediately, right? Yeah. So then uh, Dyson finished some phrases. Yeah. And then uh, would you then explain us on, uh, on how your feeling words that um, you have heard and uh, for the first time that uh, Dai chose this um, novel as a, a source of the um, new opera? Well, it's quite funny, yeah. I mean, Di and I um, met when I was studying singing at, at music college, um, <clears throat> and I did do a bit of composition, but by, by the time I'd left, I, I was um, into directing and writing. And yeah, we've collaborated an awful lot um, on the choral pieces, on sort of large monodies, um, translations of other things. Um, and there's always been one rule. I'm quite a political theatre maker <clears throat> um, in my own right, but I'm not with Di, and it's really good. It's, uh, I, I will often propose a theme, and he goes, no, nah, why don't you do it about uh, your daughter who's four? Or why don't you write something about... Um, Oh, I don't know. Why don't you write something that's about the sea? That would be an interesting subject. So <clears throat> I'm always forced into uh, a, a, a sort of very universal theme. Um, 
because Di, Di quite rightly says, well, you know, if it's, a, if it's all really gritty and political, is it, is it going to have any longevity? And it's like, actually, no, maybe not. Um, and then he came with a dream of Armageddon. Um, and he, he came saying, you know, that you'd asked him for something that was relevant for today. And then he came with something that was uh, a sort of future casting, um, which is really interesting. So it still has that eternal theme because actually, if you analyse our society politically, you can probably pretty much predict things going in a 70 year cycle. You can also predict the fact it's that that H.G. Wells is predicting a total war situation in 1901 is not rocket science at all. Um, at the time, there was there was saber rattling going. It was it was the race for Africa, imperialism, white supremacism of the Germans and of the English. Both, um, <clears throat> neither was a particularly pleasant. Um, ple neither of them were particularly pleasant organized political organizations. Um, in the UK, uh, sixty percent of uh, citizens didn't have the right to vote. In Germany, nobody had the right to vote. So you know the the whole idea that the First World War was about freedom sort of really wasn't. It was about the rights of Europeans' oldest aristocratic families to own most of the world. Um, so H.G. Wells is a socialist, and he's, well, proto-socialist, and he's future casting what will happen. And then, so that's happened in the First World War, and it's happened in the Second World War. War is a, a we're in, always in a constant state of war, so maybe this is not so much a political opera in as much as it's an, etern an opera with an eternal theme that is about how we organise ourselves in an errant way as humans. Um, so yeah, so then I thought, well, it's all, it's all the same. Also, the important thing to know is that it starts on a train. And when we were 21, 22, we pitched all over the place um, an opera that started on the train. Now, the problem with the pitch was it really didn't go anywhere. <laughs> but two of them. Yeah, two of us. Okay. Yeah. And then, and, then, and then no surprise that no one wrote us back. Yeah, we were terrible. We were terribly upset as 20 <laughs> Like, why is no one returning our calls? <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, essentially, that's, that's, uh, that, that's the thing. When I wrote the first draft, um, I was very faithful to the text because I thought, well, this is very, you know, we're, we're not being political. But then actually, then Dice sort of said, this isn't really what I expected from you. So then I sort of unleashed a bit um, and it has become... Yeah, there are certain aspects of this that mirror my dissatisfaction and my predictions. I would say that actually for a, for a British person, um, I don't think, well, actually globally, there's no surprise that there's a pandemic. It's been predicted by scientists, but modern politicians who are obsessed with austerity um, <clears throat> uh, sort of just ignored them. I mean, the, we ran out of intensive... Um, care beds in the United Kingdom last year, the year before. It's happening every year because our social welfare fund, uh, services in Europe, across the board, are not funded properly due to the financial crisis, mm -hmm. due to austerity. That's why Europe is in chaos now. Um, that's why America is in chaos. I believe that in Japan you have a very well-funded social welfare um, hospital system. So, you know... Um, None of this is surprising, let's say. Um, <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. So now we will go more into the content of the work. In the original work, um, the story starts on a train. Two men are conversing with each other, and then Cooper starts talking about his nightmares and the dreams he has been having. So he's always just reading his newspaper. And then gradually, he and his beautiful partner are living happily. And then there's this one dark thought that just seeps into the peaceful life. And then gradually, dark clouds start to roll overhead, threatening their peaceful life. 
And then gradually, they are thrown into a really terrible world, a terrible dimension. And there's the fear that comes, that very no, vacant kind of fear. But Harry, when you made a libretto out of this work, um, I know that you made a lot of changes. And one of the interesting changes was the two main characters, Cooper and Bella. Cooper is the man who is constantly having these dreams. And people, someone who used to work under him, starts to gain power up in the north and then ultimately becomes a dictator and is coming after the happy couple. And so he starts having these nightmares. But on the other hand, Bella, actually in the original novel, the name Bella does not appear at all. So that's the name that you gave her. But in the relationship of these two people, um, the couple were living without any want, but then there are waves of different things rolling over. Them. And then it's not Cooper who sees the need to do something. It's actually the woman, Bella, who sees the need to do something about the situation. And so in the opera, that's the role of a protagonist almost. And she's the one who feels the need to liberate um, themselves from um, the threat. And so she says that love is based on freedom. And then that's when she would want uh, Cooper to realize this. So Bella is trying to lead Cooper to realize this contradiction. We need to stand up to this. And it's the woman's realization that actually pulls them through. So this sort of a very particular type of a main character, the Cooper and Bella, so as a composer, Fujikura-san, what kind of impact did it have on Fujikura-san? Any thoughts? So, first of all, the, the adaptation that from the original work, what I thought was great was the changes. I don't know. I think it was Harry's raw ID, I think, because I was the third voice, but I was really happy about this idea. So this woman in the dream is just simply beautiful and please don't go into war. It's not that type of a woman. So we need to be in the reality of today. So we, he said, no, it's not a modern woman. And also the fact how Harry, as an opera, Soprano is the star, uh, an opera. It's always good to hear, see an opera where the soprano is a star. And the woman in the dream, Bella is the main character, how she can be in the spotlight, how she can shine, how she can show her strength, the beauty. That's the kind of opera that I wanted to, reading what Harry has written also, this from, it's within a man's dream. It's a story about a man's dream, but the leader, somebody who revolutionizes or somebody who innovates, who, who is, takes the action, a powerful woman is very attractive in such a world. So that's why I thought it was great that how he positioned Bella. So with that, that inspired me to, in the direction, Lydia Steiner, Steiner, when she was directing, we we knew that she was going to direct this. So we have always worked together. We've always been really good friends. To Lily, I asked her what she thought, what she thought about it. Lily was like, no, it's a great idea. She was on board as well. So that we should really push forward with, push this um, Bella character into the work. And that's how we sort of proceeded so from the music standpoint, as an opera, it's almost something you can do that none other forms of art can do, as Ono-san has mentioned. 
each character, we can go really deep into their characters, deep into their personality, their background, what kind of a history they have. So what you cannot actually read into too much in the work. So, so it's more, he's more of a hero in the work, H.G. Wells' story, but we actually position Bella as more of the hero as opposed to Cooper. So we position Cooper as more of an average man, or maybe slightly more, a, really, a little bit passive character as opposed to what H.G. Wells writes. So Bella is, that's why Bella shines. Bella's like, it's almost like the woman, sometimes you kind of leave things unturned. So Bella is the type says, no, 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 we need to take action. Bella pulls Cooper out pulls to create this better world. So Bella is leading this work. So music wise, what I thought was the second scene she appears. The first scene is in the train setting. So the, the rain is drizzling and it's a typical type of a, a British day. This is a common day for me as I live here. <laughs> so the dream that follows of Cooper, and then we have Bella coming in, attractive woman in the dream. And then it's not just a simply beautiful girl, beautiful, sexy woman. It doesn't end there. Then we start to see Bella changing. It's not about Bella changing herself. It's about we start to see more of Bella, her real personality. So I wanted to really build that into the music to express that transformation that the audience will see and it's only music can only do that so what i thought was at that time we thought as we were composing if we have an orchestra and also the singers we had a rehearsal of bringing all the musical parts together and hujugura san was listening to this remotely and we asked for his opinions on that rehearsal and the second scene that Fujikura has just mentioned, where Bella and Cooper uh, sort of encounter in the romance or love, is a very sensual, but then it's almost like a stormy excitement. It's really passionate. And then orchestration is it's incredible. You feel that. There is that tension. It, it builds into the climax. So Harry is the one who wrote this part. So that climax, musically, Fujikura san really captured that climax. But then, as you mentioned, Bella herself has different clouds. We have the, the snow. She's feeling all of these changes that are happening around them. And then she's thinking, no, we should do something. I realize this now. And uh, we're all lost here in this world. So let's say hello to each other. It's a wonderful line. I think there's a wonderful line that appears. And then the orchestra, the sound has this really nice, really tone, whispering type of a music. And then all of a sudden, she, when I first met the love Love without freedom is nothing, is what she says. It's almost like a conclusion. And then she kind of stands and push forward. And that music, that part, I think Fujikura's orchestration, the first sort of a stormy scheme, the passion, the sensual, slowly as an orchestration, it becomes more transparent. It becomes more quiet, subdued. It, and it becomes profound. And that's what we feel the orchestra, the Bella's personal or like a emotional, I guess, journey is almost like a haiku. And the Cooper and Bella's contrast that we see, it's incredible, it's expressed. So how did you feel trying to write to this story? Would you go that song? So when I'm writing the music, First, initially, before going with uh, Dream of the Armageddon by H.G. Wells, and when, when you first approached me to work on this, 
I don't know if you thought about this, but Onosai already had in mind who I should work as a writer. <clears throat> and it's so important who we point in. And, and I was always aware that that's why I was, I've been working with Harry Ross for 22 years. And I told him, yes, I have a person, my partner, and he should be on this project. And Onosan says, yes, please bring him in. So we don't have offer as such normally. Sometimes you work with a great person and then you're forced into a, another writer because it's a project of some kind. So in that sense, for us to be able to get on this project, why I'm saying this now is what you just asked now, when I'm writing the music, every day I'm speaking with Harry every day, texting each other, emailing each other on the phone. We're constantly in conversation. This scene, what is Cooper thinking? What is Bella thinking? What is she saying? So what is she thinking while she's saying this? So maybe Bella is starting to think of something else, but Cooper is just looking at something that's in front of him. He only feels what's in front of him when and he's not really uh, he's not really interested. He's a, a bit of apathetic. So he's sort of he's just trying to enjoy this a new married life. But Bella, on the other hand, she has things going up brewing in her mind. And that's what I was look, confirming with Harry as I'm writing this. So when I'm writing this, we're always in conversation, Harry and I. So when a new character comes in, why does new character come in? Why is he here? Why is she here? So what kind of relationship do they have with Cooper and Bella? So in a way, devil's advocate is what I would say. So I'm always asking him questions. So it, because we have such great trust, because we have this best re friend relationship, that's why we are able to work this. And then, although we say collaborate, there needs to be a trust between the artist and also as an opera, because we can only express through music. So in terms of a, a ratio, the way we have also characters that appearing in the opera and the speed of the singing will vary depending on the singer. So for Bella, she starts with a more of an innocent type of a pace. And then it's melodious, but it's a long melody that she works with. And now Cooper, he's the average um, type of uh, melody, um, almost like a speech pattern, not too long, not too short. Mm. And in scene one, on the train, the other person that he is talking to, who ultimately appears in the dream as a dictator, this man is more of a frustrating, irritating kind of person. And so his name is Fortnum. So when Fortnum sings, there's always this very ambivalent, unstable kind of wavering kind of movement. And on top of that, the wonderful thing about an opera that it, you can use the orchestra to express, you can use this tremolos and um, background music. so that even when you're on the train just um, sitting across each other, one man talks to the other, you're talking to a stranger, but you can feel that there's something wrong about this person, you don't like him. You know, you have those uh, kinds of moments. You know, people you would rather not have met. But musically, I wanted to turn the level up. And for Bella, she starts off innocent, but gradually, she just becomes more um, complex, not just someone who's beautiful and innocent. And so her singing starts to change. And the orchestration also changes. Sometimes it's transparent, uh, but it comes quite um, rich and deeper. So, Fujikura san, you have the romanticism and the reality and 
the um, all kinds of things that happen in reality. And I believe all of that was drawn out by Harry's libretto. Harry, I think it's the magic uh, of Harry's could you libretto. Then, uh, say um, about your, your creation of uh, Bella and existence of Ella, Bella or Cooper, relationship with, between um, them. And also you have um, created um, the dictator. Um, his name is Johnson, um, you know. Uh, this is a um, very, you know, unique name, Johnson as a dictator, okay? And uh, <laughs> a, um, your, um, in your libret, um, the appearance, the first appearance of um, uh, Johnson, he, he says that uh, um, uh, I'm, the person in a wrong personality. But uh, th actually, this is a parody, right? Because in, in uh, a dictator um, doesn't say all, and, uh, normally, and uh, you, I'm, I'm a wrong personality. It's, it's a right personality. And, uh, in, and then he said that in wrong way, but actually, it should be in right way. But and then also his um, attitude of an action, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, um, is a little bit funny. And then, uh, uh, is it your intention and um, very clear um, to describe this personality as a um, person with solemn, of course? A dignity and a power, and the, in the on the other side, um, kind of funny character, a little bit, you know, how to say, it? and uh, it's in a very famous lit film, for example, than the dictator of Chaplin, you know, uh, the great and, yeah, yeah, I think that then uh, um, I I heard and then I heard the music. And then I read your libretto, and then immediately I found that this imagination that uh, there should be two different um, uh, characters in one person to be a dictator. Well, yeah, I, I think that's true. Um, also, if in in our sort of modern dem democracies at the moment. Um, pretty much if you're in a situation of modern leadership, you can say what you want. Um, so if you look at Trump, he says what he wants. Um, sometimes he, he, you can imagine him saying, oh, I want you to believe in a wrong personality. I can walk out in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot someone, for instance, he rather famously said. Um, <clears throat> you have the, 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 the difference, the disparity between the dignity of the office and the indignity of the office holder. Um, which in many authoritarian populist, um, authoritarian nationalist, democratically elected um, politicians, um, you can really feel that. You know, you can feel, certainly as a British person, I personally, my personal opinion of our own premier is he lacks, there's something, there's something quite calculating about him, but he also pretends to be a buffoon. It's an act. He's a very intelligent man. Um, I always wonder, you know, the, the things that he did were always for the maximum media coverage. Even that when he rugby tackled that um, young Japanese boy when he was in Tokyo. Do you remember when he, he faced him off this, like, 11-year-old? I mean, and you'd think as a British person, well, that's really... But, but it got coverage. Uh, when he talked about painting buses um, before he was elected prime minister, um, <clears throat> it was a diversionary tactic. It's very clever. People are very clever but they pretend to be stupid. And that's a new way of being a dictator uh, or, or of being an authoritarian populist. I'm not saying that our prime minister is a dictator, neither is Trump, but they're close. If, you look at, if you're a political scientist, there's, um, the, the, there's a line that hasn't yet been crossed, but it could be crossed. Um, both, uh, lots of modern leaders have begun to attack the, attack the things like the judiciary the church, um, the offices of the state that have nothing to do with 
democracy um, with, with, with the de democratic system. It's called the pillars of the state. So it's happened in Poland, it's happened in Hungary, um, <clears throat> it's happening all over the world. This is not a unique thing, but uh, yeah. Um, so, you, but in, in any dramatic work, you always want to give the people who are creating the premiere and subsequent things, if you're lucky enough for other things to, to happen, if, um, to give them as many options as they like. So yeah, he can be like the great dictator, he can play it a different way. Even with Bella and Bella's motivation, uh, you could read it that she's motivated to act. She's always had the power to act, but she's motivated to act because she's sort of with this man who's obsessed by the news and can't perform sexually. And it's like, oh, for God's sake, let's do something about this. Yeah. I wouldn't really like that personally, but there's an option for someone to read it. <laughs> that. There are, you, you always have to have as many different options, I think, uh, for, f to make a, a, a piece of work last. Yeah, for, or... for the, and also for the, for the give a freedom to have a director to, and, and the music director to, um, to make it their own production, especially when we have an amazing yeah. uh, director like Lydia, who's a great imagination. Just to say that the, in the H.G. Wells uh, original text, uh, the dictator is called Eva Shah. Yeah. And then uh, we didn't change that name, just that the original dictator's, H.G. Wells' character is Evesham, that he didn't have a first name. So therefore, yeah. Harry, you chose the first name as Johnson. And then the time when we were writing this opera, uh, the prime minister in England was Theresa May. Yeah. yeah so, I mean, I mean, it, I mean, so, so therefore, I mean, <laughs> And then also, I remember that Boris Johnson was just resigned from a foreign minister at that time. So that was the time that the opera was made and then it was completed. So in a way, after the, our opera, the prime minister, well, Boris Johnson became prime minister and then the coronavirus happened. So in a way that strange that, that the world has catching up towards our opera, which is, so th this is not something like a, we wrote an opera which is based on the, based on the current situation, but it's not possible if you look at the timeline. So that, I thought that was quite interesting, <laughs> interesting that how meaningful it is to be done in this um, uh, kind of miraculously worlds are coming towards the this opera. And it, so therefore it is important that, and meaningful that we do it this yeah. month and then <clears throat> to, watch it, to watch it this month. Yeah. In Harry's libretto, there's a, another interesting character that appears too. We were talking about Cooper, Bella, and then we have Johnson. So we introduced the three, but then we have another two, Inspector. It's sort of like a Johnson's PR man, sort of, so <laughs> PR minister. <laughs> and we have a singer, Cynic, who is a tenor artist, a singer in Fujikura-san's music in the 1920s, Marina Dietrichi, Beatrix's <laughs> work when she's with her uh, fishnet stocking, her long legs with her smoke puffed in the air, a very um, very sensual sort of a Dietrich's, that kind of bluesy kind of a feel. Music is what we, there's a scene that appears. And why mal? No, mal. At the end, art the music. And art the music. And art music is regeneration music is what it's a, there is a type of genre because of that it's sort of captured into the whole story there's one character as such and there's another uh, a cynic uh, this is played by one that one person cynic is a cynical person and he looks at the world of Johnson and, and, the, and Bella's resistance sort of a movement and she, this person goes back and forth between the two so he's kind of shallow but 
he quietly gets on the small boat with Bella. Come on, let's get on the boat. So gives him the tick, gives her the ticket, and then she sings the song. I feel <coughs> a very uh, a strange, eccentric person. So when you're writing this Fujikura-san to express these characters, the with the wind instrument that very um you have the sound the voice that kind of screeches through and then this person sing, sing cynically but then at the end he gives the ticket to bella and if you go across before she crosses bella is shot by a soldier and there's a scene as such and with that you have cooper who's lost Bella, completely lost for life, and he's going down emotionally, and he sort of sinks into his own sorrow. And then in the starry night, you have Cooper and Bella's stars are shining. So it's almost like we're back in the dream once again. And that's how the story develops. So these side characters, the characters are surrounding these main characters. How, what sort of image, what sort of characters did you have in mind as you were writing this? How is it your um, uh, imagination to create such um, such an, an, uh, characters, such as uh, Inspector and then Cynic, and then uh, Cynic is singing, singing, and in the uh, middle of his role, um, the willow, willow. Willow. This is a song of uh, Shakespeare's and uh, Othello. For, and, and then uh, uh, Verdi has composed on this the same um, uh, text of Shakespeare. Uh, salce, salce, salce. And then, of course, this is a uh, uh, symbol of lost love. But um, um, is it an, uh, more lost love? Um, maybe uh, the whole uh, people in on this um, uh, world um, is losing love or something. Everybody lost love or something. How how did it, uh, how was in your imagination of uh, these personalities? Hey, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> there's there's a short answer and a long answer. I mean, as as a writer, um, and Dai asked me deliberately not to tell him, um, but I I base certain characters and their functionality on operatic ar archetypes, and so there are certain things that I go, okay, that could be like that, and I don't tell Dai what I'm thinking because otherwise then it becomes too similar to whatever that might be. Um, <laughs> so that's a really evasive answer, but I still won't tell Dai which uh, characters are based don't, on. Don't tell me. Which operatic archetype that's in my brain. Uh, but we could talk about that over a beer maybe later. <laughs> but then also the <clears throat> everyone has obviously their, their role to play and their function to play. Um, and the the willow song is again it's i think everything has a double meaning so that it gives the production team who are giving birth to the work the the the, the possibility to make their own choices and go that's what it feels like to me it has that resonance um and also a lot of the time i'll propose a character um and we're you know as the piece goes as as we get through the piece, we'd we'd have some bare bones characters, and we're writing at the same time. So, mm -hmm. Dai's like, I need this to happen now. Can you? Because because it's it's musically, I need it for the pace of the music. It's like, well, if we have this character here to do that, so that will change this. The inspector, I think, came to life like that. We we wanted, well, actually, I wanted a sort of massive chaos and everyone breaking everything, but then in order then that would have been rubbish musically. 
So then we've got the inspector comes in and the inspector can have a very controlled effect that will still break everything down and give Dai the musical opportunity to create disruption in a controlled way rather than in a chaotic way. Um. <laughs> and, 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 and it was good that the inspector is a female voice too, which is contrasting to Bella. So Yeah. Yeah. But equally, the it can it can be it's it's a mezzo, so you know yeah. you can you can also cast, a, you can cast it however you like as well. Mm. I mean, you know we've said mezzo, but I'm sure if anyone ever did this in twenty years' time, they might go okay. Well, let's try it with a, a countertenor. Mm, Maybe yeah. I. <clears throat> it's not specified. Um, mm. Specified in our we specify mm. mezzo because no. yeah. Yeah. we just by the voice um so yeah the the and the willow song as well it's uh Di will tell you that that we've always i always like to quote because i think that opera is a very specific genre um it comes from a specific place a specific cultural place a specific place of western european culture and in terms of a live western european line of producing artwork this uh, i think opera is is the most complex um mm. it has so many different figures in play and that's why it's great to attempt to make a work i never think that an opera is done it's attempted um because we we, we are by no means um perfect or any of us and mm. so that's why i like to think about other things and then i thought well the willow song even goes back further than that. It has a theatrical um, <clears throat> the, um, a presence. And before that, it was an English folk song. Um, so we've got this long line that sort of roots this in a specific place, um, culturally, which is relevant for this work. Um, and it's also a song of betrayal. As you say, it can also be read as a song of lost love a song of a world which has become so dystopian that there is no opportunity or possibility for love. All of these things are, are readings that can happen because of the cultural richness of the other interpretations of it that came before. Mm. And, and those will always be mirrored with, um, with this, but not contrasted. That's not the point. It's not to say, oh, we're doing a, we're doing a new one that's better, but uh, mm -hmm. to, <laughs> yeah. we're standing dramaturgy um, of, of, of history, I suppose. Wonderful. Yeah. And so, um, Fujikura-san, Fujikura-san, um, um, the other main character um, of, that appears in the opera is actually the chorus. The chorus is so important <coughs> from the very beginning. Um, the work starts a cappella without um, accompanying music, issuing a warning, or in the train. The humdrum daily lives and the people are taken up with the humdrums of daily life and are not able to care or think about other people. Or the chorus appears as people who suddenly take up weapons and become soldiers and become very destructive and really break down the stage. And um, in the dancing scene, the singer sort of comes up um, with this very modern kind of a new um, song. And then there's this uncanny waltz with um, three beats and four beats, um, which is a very unsettling kind of music. And then the boy soldier who shoots Bella or Cooper, and then in this very chaotic world, the chorus sings a sort of requiem, it's a very painful, like, and then the boy soprano um, sings on top of that. And so 
And what um, features did you um, put into the chorus piece? Well, when I commissioned a size of this, uh, an opera this size, well, I had to think about it as an op a composer because I love writing operas. I really do wish similar requests will come in future, but I thought maybe this will be the last work I ever get commissioned. And so when I think it might be my last work in opera, I want to do everything I ever wanted to do. This is the only opportunity for me to do what I wanted to do. And so the orchestra was at my disposal. I could also um, have solists singing. And Ono-san, I think I asked you back then, um, do we have a chorus with us? <laughs> And immediately he said, of course, the new National Theatre Tokyo has a wonderful chorus. Please put them to good use. And as Harry was saying, Harry himself is a singer. And Lydia, who is directing this, is also um, a singer originally. And she's really good with a big chorus. And a little before I started writing this opera, I was actually um, an artist in residence uh, for the Tokyo Chorus, um, and I was working with Harry on many of those works. And so, in using a chorus, uh, I wouldn't say exactly confident, but I thought I could do it. And I thought this was the opportunity. To, it's almost like a concert, an, um, a concerto for a uh, chorus. And so when you told me, Ono-san, that you have a wonderful chorus, and you were right. And at the rehearsal, I was impressed by the musical quality of the singing. And it's not just the singing. Following Lydia's direction, they could respond to her directions so well. And so the chorus members were really good. Lydia was saying that um, she has never worked with such a wonderful um, group of people. And, and so in that way, the a dream of Armageddon is not a work of a handful of singers just doing their thing. It's also a combination with all of those chorus members uh, coming in, going out, taking on different roles, which is a really great thing uh, um, of the opera. And, and I'm glad I, I was able to create an opera with so much chorus in it. So you mentioned uh, Ms. Lydia Steyer and how she works with uh, the chorus. And I do want to make a comment here. The chorus on stage, getting them on stage and singing is quite difficult to do nowadays in the European theatres. And because of the coronavirus pandemic, the way that we handle our members of the chorus is quite difficult. The theater um, still suggests having the chorus um, be not on stage or maybe on the side of the stage or maybe in the front of the um, audience seat. And for the orchestra, if they're playing in an orchestra pit, we have a max limitation of 20 people. And then we would have Verdi's opera and Oppenbach um, with that small size. That's what we're being asked to do currently. But we were really lucky because the Japanese government changed its policy um, because it was eyeing the Olympics for next year. They started easing the entry restrictions into the country. And since March, this is probably the first time that an international 
direction team or production team was able to come together. And we have these three um, singers who are based in Berlin. They were able to come for the first time in eight months um, to sing at the new National Theatre Tokyo. And we also have two very good Japanese soloists and a chorus. For the chorus, uh, we do have to observe a certain physical distance in between. And so we needed to think of the musical balance and also the um, new normal based um, appropriate distancing. And Lydia has really great understanding of all of those restrictions, but she will be um, leading them um, to the max limit of what they could do. Also, taking into account all of the um, healthcare related considerations that we have to take. And this international production team, creative team, and the orchestra all went through the 14 day quarantine. And we had to rewrite the negotiation, well, we had to rewrite the contract document. And they really did quarantine for day, 14 days. I know um, that they did feel limited in their freedom, but they have really been very energetic in the practices and the rehearsals. And so I believe we were very lucky. And we are so happy that we could have this wonderful team work on your new piece with your Cressa. And we're going to have AG Wells work coming out in the three-dimensional world. And we're just about to see that with our own eyes. And I really do hope that people in the audience who are listening to us today would be able to see um, the real work on stage. Well, we would love to continue on asking you to talk, but unfortunately, it's time for us to end this session. And I really thankful to our guests who have taken time out of their super busy schedule when you have the premiere coming up. So, Harisan, san thank you very much. And Ono-san, thank you very much. I'm really um, sure that members of the audience are excited about seeing real premiere. But if you have any um, lasting comments to the members of the audience, can I ask you for one comment each? And, and what do you want them to look forward to? Starting with you, Ona san So Cooper, Bella, these two characters, and the woman, the bell, Bella, how they transition from this really romantic world to think about the world, think about the people around them, to remember to say hello, to, to talk to each other, and how she strong comes to realize this, and she founds these words to express herself, and losing her life to really fight for the cause of the resistance. We should join our hands that spirit the message is something that i hope the audience will appreciate harry if you can give a remark to the japanese audience um one of the things about the opera is it's it's a very anti-soundbite opera because the situation we find ourselves in globally is due to sound bites um but if i could give a a short sound bite which is a bit of an anathema uh, i would say really digest all of the short information you get and try and differentiate truth from fiction and try and be very objective and kind in your responses to other people. Finally, would you say so? So I think I mentioned this before, but writing an opera and then it takes about three years for it to actually go on the stage. 
even with that length of a time, just so happened the opera that we wrote is now finally here in this world today. It is represents what we are living now. So to see this this month, November 2020, that experience itself is something that will be unforgettable, is what I feel, because because the work is great, thank you, we appreciate that, but at the same time, the background of the world that we are now, everything that we are living now is sort of condensed into the stage. This is a miraculous coincidence. So seeing it live, not seeing it, great difference. So we hope, we hope that everybody comes to see this. So we have a saying. Candidacy, you vote. Please vote. <laughs> <laughs> just, just come. Just come. Just come. <laughs> just come. Thank you so much for that. So, I dream of Armageddon. We will premiere from the 15th and until the 23rd of November. Just come. Please join us at the theater. So, once again, thank you so much for the three artists. And today's talk session is going to part of the Culture Connect uh, online festival that we are organizing. So we're going to be uh, updating and showing the latest of the artists and work at cultural parts of Britain. And we'd like to show you, continue to show you different parts of that. So thank you so much for joining us until this time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, Harry. Thank you. Bye. 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 See you later. Bye. 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 Bye.